All right, quick little update here. Let me turn this off. This is the bypass capacitor. And if you look up here in our output for our speaker, it's right here. It's supposed to be at 10 microfarad. And as you notice, it ties directly to ground. And they're using this pin here as a ground. So this was originally looped from this pin to this pin, and these two pins are both ground. And what can you see that's not right with this picture? Whoever replaced this cap put it in backwards. So they put the minus on the plus side, and they put the plus on the ground side. So that's one of the reasons things weren't sounding right or working right, obviously, because we were basically shorting bypass this resistor, which was way out of tolerance anyways. So this capacitor probably is already fried or whatever, but I have another one here, and uh, I'm going to put that in. And uh, just wanted to show you that. That's why you got to be really careful when somebody else has worked on something. You have to look at every little thing and make sure um, that there's not a problem. So, all right, that's it. And uh, like I said, this is the beginning of part three. And uh, as we keep going, I'll come back and show you what we get. All right, we made some pretty good progress here. Um, ended up getting into some pretty major surgery on this. Um, a lot of the resistors were way out of tolerance and needed replaced. And uh, so we had a few things we had to correct other than just capacitors. But as you can see, all the capacitors have been replaced. Um, these little domino mic mica capacitors, we, uh, we always leave those because they usually don't go bad. And if they do, they short out. And uh, if that's the case, we'll, we'll find that out when we go to test this again. Um, you can see a lot of the resistors here have been replaced. And if we go over to here... This is the pile of capacitors that just got replaced. They may have, they may be in or out of tolerance, but they were not leaky or shorted. This was the pile of capacitors that were leaky. They actually leaked, they were bad, they were no good. So we had this many bad ones. And these were all the resistors that were 20% out of tolerance or more. Um, so they were pretty bad. And as you can see, some of them were the bigger ones that are actually used, you know, for power, not just for signal. So, um, obviously, that's why the voltages were all over the place. So, we, uh, we went in and we redid that. I put a new safety cap and redid the uh, terminal strip over here for the power. I made a, another terminal strip here, and we redid... Uh, I just kept the old... Uh, can capacitor on the top so it looks good and just filled it in you know epoxied it in in the bottom just to fill it in and then redid all this um, this power resistor 1500 ohm was actually spot on still it was good and uh, what this is is this is a dropping resistor in the main power supply and on older models of this, I, ha I suspect that instead of this, they had a little field coil speaker, and the field coil would take the place of this for this for the speaker. And um, I know on my R S20R, it has the field coil. And I think I saw some pictures of these online, some, the, the real early ones of these that had the field coil speaker too. I'm pretty sure, but not positive. So anyways... Um, I'm going to flip this, we're going to try this out and see, check our voltages, bring it up on the Variac again, make sure everything's still working. Uh, I did make a couple slight changes to the amplifier section. Uh, this resistance, um, I, it was a 690 ohm resistor, I only had a 620, so I put that in. I went from a 10 microfarad to 22. And I went from my 6K6, which was reading bad, um, the only thing I could find to replace it was a 6V6, which 6V6s will replace a 6K6, but a 6K6 will not replace a 6V6. Um, 6V6s can have a higher bias voltage and so forth, 
And because of that, if you have a 6V6 amplifier and you put a 6K6 in there, um, the biasing will be off. This one, if you bias it that way, it'll just kind of act like a 6K6. It should work fine. Um, these also have a higher power capacity than a 6K6. But again, it's what I had. It'll work, and that's what I'm going to use. And you can see the little transformer. The other thing I noticed is this transformer says universal. It's a Stancore universal output transformer. I suspect that this is a replacement. When I first got this thing opened, I noticed that these wires were kind of run over the top of everything and kind of hacked into here. And I also noticed that th this is being held in with, with two Phillips head screws, which doesn't seem right for this vintage of equipment. Most of this stuff was uh, riveted, and if you notice, everything's riveted. And anything that had screws either had hex head screws or had uh, slotted screws. So this, I'm pretty sure, is a replacement. Um, but that's okay. It's it's the correct one. It'll work. And uh, other than that, I think we're ready for a Variac test. Then we need to get onto the top of this thing and do some work on it. Uh, the, the little rubber grommets, and you can't see those from below here, but the little rubber grommets that the tuning capacitor sits up on are just rotted away. So we're going to have to replace those and, uh, you know, check all that. And then finally, last of all, at the end, we will be able to do the, uh, the alignment. And if nobody's been in here with their uh, tweaker of doom, it should be a pretty straightforward alignment. So we'll get it up onto the Variac, and we'll be right back. Okay, we're all set up. And I've got the Variac on. I've got this turned on. And we're going to start bringing the voltage up slowly. All right, bring it up a little ways. See what we get. Make sure we're turned on here. Oh, we're not turned on. There, there we go. Okay. Helps to turn the thing on. And since this is a direct heated uh, rectifier tube, you get voltage much faster on that than you do on the rest of the tubes, which are all indirectly heated. All right, so what you'll see is as I turn this up, once the filaments warm up on the other tubes, you'll see the voltage start dropping back down. It's up to 250 right now, and I'm only up to about 60 volts. But you're going to see them drop as soon as it, there it goes. There it goes. That, there's all the other tubes heating up now. And they're starting to draw current, so it's actually putting a load on the power supply, which is normal. Okay, so let's bring this up slowly. I'm now up to about 75 volts. And looking at the voltage reading chart, when we look at the rectifier tube, the output of that at full look, full power should be 350 volts roughly. So let's uh, let's bring her up to about 90 volts. I got 90 volts in, 275 out. That looks good. Let's go for 120, and at 120 volts, we're getting about. 352 volts. That's good. Beautiful. Okay. Now let's take a wire and just connect it to see if... Hey! How about that? Good. All right. I think we're in good shape here. We, uh, of course, we're just getting static because I don't have anything connected. Uh, I don't have an antenna connected yet, just a piece of alligator clip wire. But let's see here if I can stretch something over to 
over to the antenna outside. Okay, now I'm on my 43 foot vertical antenna outside. I don't even know what band I'm on, but let's tune around and see if we get anything. Something. All right. Okay. I'm going to turn this down. Okay. I'm going to say that we uh, we at least have a radio that's working. Let's check a couple of the other voltages real quick. Um, we have 350 volts on the main rectifier. And if we go to the 6V6 or 6K6, um, grid voltage on that, or I mean the cathode voltage should, should be, it says around 15 volts, 13 to, it's either 13 or 15 it says. Let's clip on there, 15, okay, that's a 15. So it's 15.3, that's perfect. Um, tubes are warm, but they're not burning up anymore. So, I would say we have some success here. Um, excellent. Okay, so I guess our next thing to do is to, uh, we're going to flip this around and check the top part, and we're going to do some cleaning on the top. And then, uh, last but not least, we'll go for the alignment. All right, so right here, you can see I've taken out the first screw and uh, I'm going to pull this out and you can see how bad this is. So there's one here, one here, and one here. Three different standoffs. And I'm going to just take those out. I'm going to clean this real well, clean the chassis real well on the top, and then replace these rubber grommets with one of these hopefully that should fit. I think they look... Uh, they look pretty similar, so I think one of these ought to be all right. Okay, so here we go. I'll be back when I get it done. All right, so here we are, and I got everything put back together. I got the faceplate back on. I cleaned it up. Uh, basically, all I did was get some goop or gojo, this stuff right here, and just rubbed it on with a rag and just polish this out and you know it's it looks like a survivor it's not all rusty um, the decals are still good I'm not touching this radio um, the cabinet is a little bit rougher it has some surface rust on it but I really like the look of it it looks like a survivor so I think I'm gonna leave it as is I'm gonna do the goop cleaning on the uh, cabinet as well and whatever it turns out that's how it's gonna look as far as the knobs concerned, you really have to be careful cleaning vintage knobs. Um, plastic knobs with aluminum coating on them, or brass plating, or painted on dots, painted on lines, anything like that. You got to be careful because if you soak them in anything too harsh, it'll take that stuff right off. What I found the best thing to do is get just a, a little pan of hot water, as hot as you can make a tap water, put some regular old dish soap in it and soak it, then take a toothbrush once it's soaking and while it's in the water just go over it, clean all of the knurls out and you can see it actually comes out pretty good. I mean you just go with the brush and it turns out pretty good. So uh, I'm gonna get the knobs on and I think our next step is to go ahead and do the alignment. All right, we're about to start the alignment procedure here. And 
I always kind of like to read through it all before uh, getting started. They're all pretty similar. Um, once you've done an AM, you know, this vintage of radio, um, you pretty much know your way around all the rest. Um, the biggest thing is how they want you to introduce the signal into the radio. Now, there's many, many ways you can do it. They all work. Um, you know, you could do you can go crazy if you want and you can actually loosely couple a, if you have a tracking generator on it you can loosely couple your uh, um, spectrum analyzer sorry about that and you can do it with that for like a type of a visual alignment you can also do the visual alignment with the uh, oscilloscope um, you can use the uh, ohm meter or your voltmeter um, preferably a VTVM you know with the with the needle um, but there's many ways but I like to read through and I'll try to follow pretty much the way they do it I may change up my test equipment a little bit if I think I can get a little better adjustment or see a little better but pretty much the biggest thing is they're talking about a dummy antenna that you have to connect from your signal generator into parts of the machine during the alignment and when they talk about the dummy antenna you usually have to read through usually in the beginning somewhere and they talk about it in this case the standard RMA dummy antenna mentioned in the alignment chart consists of a 200 picofarad capacitor in series with a 20 microhenry RF choke which is shunted by a 400 picofarad capacitor in series with a 400 ohm carbon resistor. Now that's quite a little setup. Um, a lot of people, the 20 micro Henry choke will that you'll get you'll get hung up at that one right there. Um, I do have some little uh, uh, PC board mount uh, chokes or coils inductors, I should say, and uh, I'm going to look through and see if I have a 20 micro Henry. And we're going to go ahead and make this little thing up. And then once I make them up, I have a little bin uh, over here in my drawers over here. And uh, once I make one up, I save it in there. And then the next time I do one of those types of radios, I have one already. But this is the first time that uh, I've had to do this setup. That's kind of an odd setup. But we're going to do it and see uh, how it turns out. So let me dig through some of my components here and see what I got and uh, we'll go from there. Alright, here's the mess I came up with. I, the closest thing I could come up to 10 micro Henry, or 20 micro Henry's was two 10 micro Henry's in series. So there's our, 10 mi our 20 micro Henry's. Um, inductors work just like resistors with series and parallel. Same formula, same everything. So they're, they add when they're in series. So a 10 and a 10, that's 20 micro Henry's. I had a 200 picofarad capacitor and I didn't have any 400's so I just put two 200's in parallel and I measured them up on my capacitance meter and they're pretty close and I did not have a 400 ohm resistor but I did have a 470 so I put that in and I think that'll be close enough it should work. So there's our little circuit and uh, with that in mind, I guess we'll move on and uh, so when we look, our first alignment that we're going to do, let's see if we can see this, they do not want the dummy antenna and they want you to couple the signal generator into the stator plate stator plates in the center section of the tuning gang. Now when I read that and I looked what I think they're talking about is this center section right here. So we're going to couple it right up into there and I'm just going to couple my my uh, signal generator. I'll probably go through a capacitor just in case, you know, so there's no uh, chance of any DC getting back onto my uh, signal generator. And we're going to set up our 
kilocycles. Now once again, 455, you're going to see that for a while because that is our IF or, intermo or uh, intermediate frequency. So in order to uh, align these, you start with your IF and make sure those are lined up properly. Then you do your RF section, which is going to be the actual tuner itself and then the, what's called the local oscillator, which is going to be the tuner frequency plus or minus the 400 kilohertz, or 455 kilohertz, okay? Um, I believe in this case it's plus 455. And then, of course, when we go through the IF section, it's going to look at the difference, which will be 455, and we, we explained that earlier in the last video. So, let me get my signal generator put together and get uh, the wires hooked up and we'll get started alright so here we are connected up for step one of our alignment and I have everything set I have the uh, tuner set, set tuner dial set to band A 1 megahertz or a thousand kilohertz okay that's where they want it and they want us set up to the, for 455 kilocycles for intermediate frequency and they want this to go to the stator plates in the center section of the tuning gang. And what they're trying to talk about when they say that, let me move the camera here, is you can see right there, right there, they just want it hooked up in the middle of the actual tuning gang right there. Okay, I'm hoping I'm, hoping I'm getting that in there so you can see it. Let me put some light over there. There you go. So you can see I'm going right over on top of that and let me get this position back over here and you can see all right and what they're asking us to do is to adjust s one two three four five and six um, they just kind of want the dial set in the middle and they're looking for maximum audio output across the voice coil of the speaker. Now, I tried connecting, you know, a VTVM to the speaker. First of all, you got to have the speaker blasting your eardrum out, which I don't like. And second of all, um, it induces hum and so forth. So an easier way to do this is if you look on the schematics. I have a little printout of the schematics right now. Here's your detector tube, your 6H6. And right here is where your AM detection is taking place. And then it goes out of here and comes around out of here up and into the top of the volume pot. So what I'm doing is I am loosely coupling my oscilloscope to that. Now, mind you, the signal is going to be extraordinarily faint there. So I have to be on a times one probe. And you can see... If you zero in here, this is a good way to do this if you're if you have the test equipment. And you can see I'm just clipped on the insulation. I'm not even touching the wire. And basically my oscilloscope probe is act, acting like a mini antenna and it's picking up the signal. Now the downside of this is if you look up here at the scope, which I will try to get some things out of the way so you can see. Um There's about all that my scope can do right there. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much maxed out on the scope. And uh, it's just the way it is. We're just going to have to kind of make do with that. Okay. So we're going to adjust the four IF coils. Okay. Or six of them. I'm sorry. Th three of them. And there's two on each one. So there's a six adjustment slugs total. And basically all we're going to do is try to peek them out. Now I can tell you from how it sounds, if you turn the volume up a little bit, it doesn't sound too bad right how it is. I'm at negative 70 dBm for my signal. And uh, basically they're saying S1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And... Uh, you can see that, uh, I don't know here if we can see where I'm at. Here's four, six, and two is on the 
the top half of the machine and you look on the bottom half the, from the underneath you can reach one three and five so with that in mind s s1 and s2 is this first coil let me zoom back here a little bit s1 and s2 is going to be this first coil right here so we're going to start on those all right s1 is the bottom s2 is the top and all I'm going to do is adjust those and we're going to watch the scope. I'm going to put you back up on the scope here. And uh, I don't know if you'll be able to get this all in one shot or not. Um, maybe. So let's try this. And we'll listen to it a little bit. And if we go in here, we're going to adjust it. It's pretty tight. You see it flattening out? Just barely. So right there, it that one was on peak. So we didn't have to touch that one. Now we're going to go around to the front and do the same thing, okay? So I'm going to go around to this front. And uh, now that you see what I'm doing, we're going to zoom you in on the scope a little bit so we can see just exactly what we're getting here try to get some of the glare off of this if we can. Let me see here. So there's an awful lot of glare. That's better. So let me get on top. Ooh, there's one. That was off. Right about there. Okay. So that's S1 and S2. S3 and S4 is going to be the ones right across from it. So we're going to go up underneath here. And another got a little more out of that one. So as you can see, these were out. No surprise, all the caps and resistors being changed. And that was out. Let's do the last but not least, five and six. And that was just a hair off, just a tiny bit there. And S6. Five out of six of them needed a little tweak. All right. So now that we have that, okay, we go on to the next instruction. And if we look here, now let's uh, let's backtrack a little bit. Let me open up the view. And uh, okay. Let's see where I saw it. Right here. Note. Here's where I was looking for. Note. RF alignment should be accomplished through the holes provided in the cabinet bottom as the oscillator calibration will be affected slightly by changes in the capacity between the cabinet bottom and the RF coils and the wiring. So here's what we're doing. Right up here is your RF and local oscillator adjustments okay so what you're going to do is these are very critical because these are going to adjust your local oscillator and your tuning frequencies for your tuner and this part of the circuit is very sensitive to any kind of changes so if you line this up and then you put the cover the metal cover back on there's actually going to be added capacitance between these capacitors and the actual cabinet itself and it's going to throw off your alignment. So what they've done is they've put strategically placed holes under the cabinet so that you can reach your tweaker, your alignment tool, through the holes and align it with the cover on. So that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to put this all together 
and pretend that it's all assembled and then we're going to set up our next um, adjustment. Now we do have one more alignment that we have to do and that's going to be for the BFO and we're going to do that, I almost forgot it and we're going to set our BFO for 455 kilohertz okay and if you look you're going to adjust S7 okay and I'm assuming that S7 is going to be the actual BFO pitch knob and you can see it is so if we look right here S7 BFO pitch control knob so what we're going to do is we're going to, what they want you to do is set it for a perfect beat frequency, for a zero beat, and you're going to hear this as long as it's working. Um, we're going to turn off modulation. They just want 455 kilohertz, and you're going to align the BFO to be 455 kilohertz as well. And to create that CW tone that you hear, um, you adjust the pitch control by throwing off the BFO from the 455 and the two frequencies beat together and the difference between them creates an audible tone and by adjusting that you can change the pitch of the uh, CW tone when you're listening to Morse code if you want it to be a higher or lower note so that's what we're going to do and basically what they want is dead center knob they want it to be zero beaded and then up and down is going to be adjusting the pitch so let's do that um, and we'll go from there. So let's first of all turn off our modulation. So if you listen to that, we're going to go AM off. So now we just have a normal frequency. And, and you can see I'm at about negative 30 dBm. So I'm putting a pretty strong signal in there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put CW. We're going to turn this down in case it's loud. And if this works, we should be getting, um, we should be hearing a tone, which we don't know if the BFO is working or not. So let's rotate this and see what we get. Hear that? Let's turn it up a little bit. Hear that? So if I go above or below of my 455, I make that sound. Hear that? Okay. So right there. Right about there. Okay. So I'm sorry. We're not even seeing what I'm doing. So I'm adjusting this little slug using this. See that? Till you hear no sound whatsoever. Okay. And that's all there is to it. The BFO is now set. Now we can adjust that pitch. And even when we're bringing in single sideband, sometimes you can even pick that up with one of these radios, believe it or not, um, by using this to adjust for your sideband. So it's set. We don't have to mess with it. Now we can put the back on and we're all set to go. Okay. All right. Let me get the cover on and we'll be back. Okay. I just wanted to show you one more quick thing here. Um, if we look at the radio signal here, or our tag, power consumption 75 watts, and with this thing the volume turned up, and you look at the kilowatt, we are getting about 65 watts. So basically this radio is running perfectly at spec how it's supposed to, so we know we got everything set properly. 
and again we have it zero beaded so now I'm going to put the covers on. Okay, <clears throat> I've just started with the very first alignment and uh, we're at 36 megahertz on band 4 and uh, we're trying to tune in 36 megahertz with the, the three trimmer capacitors. So I just did A and there was no signal before. I did A and it popped in. So now let's go on to B and see how it sounds. see how far out these were. That one was pretty close. Right there. Okay. So we're at negative 70 dBm. And let's see, negative 90, it's gone. Negative 80, we can hear it. So, uh, okay. So we got that set. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to do the last three bands off camera because it's the same process, just basically adjusting the three trimmers for each um, band. And then uh, we're going to see how it sounds. And I'll be right back. All right, we got her all calibrated. Let's see how we do. Uh, I'm on band three, which is three to sixteen mega cycles. Let's tune around the dial a little bit and see what we get. <laughs> it's about quarter till eight at night, so uh, should be some things on. Now, the little, little explanation of to how these old radios work. If you notice, you have two adjustments. You have a tuning adjustment and you have a band spread. What you're supposed to do is you put your band spread at zero. And if you look right here, okay, you can actually see these little bands. See the dark area? What you're supposed to do is, so we go down here and let's just set it here I don't know there's going to be much on this band but you set it at the edge of the amateur band then you use your band spread and it's going to tune you through that range now like I said I don't think there's anything on that band right now well, it might be not a whole lot there's one. Now, the reason that we do this is that having this band spread gives us a much wider, more, more precise adjustment of the tuning. Rather than just moving this thing a tiny hair, this spreads that band out by adjusting it throughout that range by all this whole dial. So you use the two in conjunction together to tune. This is how you did it in the old days before you had phase lock loop and direct digital entry and all these things. So, and you can see it works really well. 
James Brown is hunting. Don't trust anything you hear on so now we go all the way back to the beginning set it back to zero and for instance uh, let's look at the for instance the uh, well, let's look at the 40 meter band okay so that 40 meters is gonna be right here which is on the third band which is where we are we take it down to 7.0 put it there all right then we bring up our volume and we start tuning through it. Now, we're going to pick up some sideband here. Let's see what's on. The Okay. So you get the point how it works. And before I close up this video, um, let's take it to AM and just see what kind of AM we get. Okay, here we go. and provolone upon fresh baked bread, a glorious work of gastron. We don't have a lot of stations down here at the bottom. And at night time. 1-800-932-7559. Unfortunately, you Miller, Benny Goodman. That's awesome. But I bet they'll really prove me for somebody who doesn't like the, the doesn't want think it's a chore and then these athletes down here to to a man 446 what are you doing you only want to do that charity you care about and now you feel stuck i mean not stuck so, I would say, and oh, the noise limiter. Auto volume control works really well, as you can see. And uh, everything's working good. So, uh, wasn't able to pick up any CW tonight, but uh, I'm sure that works as well, as we were able to zero beat this, you saw. So, the cabinet, you can see some surface rust on it, but it looks like a survivor, and I think I'm going to leave it this way, because I really like it. And the chassis, I think, turned out really well. Again, I didn't go crazy cleaning it up, but I cleaned it up, got rid of most of the rust. And all in all, I think we have a really nice little receiver. It seems like it's pretty hot and picks up a lot of stations. And uh, I think this one's going to go on eBay, because as I said earlier, um, I have my S20R. It's a really old receiver, and it's actually a really nice one. This is all original, and uh, just beautiful. It takes, it just picks up very, very sensitive receiver. Um, I love playing around with it. It has the old field coil speaker inside of it. It came with a set of uh, really old-fashioned headphones came with the SM40 uh, signal strength meter option so it was a really nice little piece of kit there so I think we're gonna sell this one um, it was a lot of fun restoring it and I hope you guys enjoyed uh, following along with me on this and uh, again give me a thumbs up if you liked the video and I think our next project we're going to start on is our uh, stereo amplifier, our tube stereo amplifier. So, alright guys, uh, thanks for hanging with me and more to come.